Welcome back, everybody. Um, hope you're refreshed for our final session here, Novel Interactions. I'm really excited to welcome you back for this part of the day. We have an exciting group here um, talking again remotely. We have Aaron Brandenburg, uh, who's a director with Kitchen Band Theater and um, one of my co-teachers for the Albion Library Branch VR <laughs> project. And then we also have a PhD candidate in the history department and archeologist Harrison Forsyth, uh, talking from a slightly different perspective, which I'm really excited to share with you today. And um, then <laughs> David Hahn, who I met incidentally at the Fivers um, exhibition a few weeks ago, who outfitted me to do After Dan Graham before I knew who he was. So I'm really excited that we're sharing the stage today. And then, um, Anna Cursereno, who's from Parkway Forest Park Friends Group, and um, she was a wonderful collaborator with us uh, last summer when we did a workshop at Parkway Forest Park. And then finally, we have faculty in cinema media arts, Tian Chan, uh, talking about Stratigraphic City. So first, I'd like to introduce Aaron Brandenburg, who will again emerge from the ether. I did it again. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Live on location from Albion Library. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, you're good to go. You ready to go? Oh okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. And I just want to say uh, how wonderful it's been to hear all the speakers today. I've been listening in and um, it's just great to hear from everybody, all the inspiring ideas and also shared challenges for working in this VR medium. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about today about a project called the Albion VR Project. Um, like I mentioned, we are working in a, in a library. So this project is funded through the Artists in the Libraries program through the Toronto Arts Council and uh, through the Toronto Public Library. And basically our project is to create a uh, public VR installation that happens in the library spaces, in the public spaces. Um, and the project is to lead community participants through, um, I think we have a, a 14 week sessions, teaching them um, how to think and create and film and edit uh, their own VR pieces. And the idea being that we're filming these pieces in 360 video and they will be digitally um, located in the spaces in the library so that once the project is complete, uh, the public will be able to come in um, to the library spaces and through an interactive map, access these um, filmed 360 experiences. Um, and the idea being that the library is a place that is curated with stories and history and um, facts that have been put together. We wanted to try to tell the story of this community um, in a way that's coming back from them and talk about what's important to them at the library and talk about who the people are that use this space. So uh, the li Albion Library is uh, located in North Etobicoke of the city of Toronto. It's uh, part of Rexdale. It's a very diverse community. And this particular branch is one of the newest branches of the Toronto Public Library and actually has amazing facilities. Um, I'm in one of their study rooms right now that I think there are five or six of them located in the branch. There's also, it has a digital technology hub. It has a maker's room that has a fully equipped video studio, um, film editing suites. Uh, and it's really uh, an amazing space that is so well utilized by this community. It's um, about to be after school right now. And this library is about to be packed with youth from the community. We actually did one of our uh, filmed experiences here last week where we were filming in the youth hub. And after school, there were probably 70 youth packed into this room, um, all using the um, equipment facilities, video games, playing games, accessing study equipment. And so the project is, is kind of a mix of, we wanna hear from our participants and what stories they're interested in telling about their community. And also a way for us to um, reflect back what is how the library is being used and, um, yeah, how the community accesses the space. So we're right in the middle of the project at the moment. Um, 
I think we're on session eight of 14 altogether. And Justine has been uh, teaching our participants along with me. And Ian has been also teaching. Uh, Toaster Lab has been our technology partner for this. And um, surprising to us, we anticipated that most of our participants would be youth um, who might be interested in this and who are also interested in uh, technology. Um, but our participants have actually come from seniors in the community and older adults who are just interested in learning about technology. So that's been really great because we get a different perspective on technology and how it's used and how you can use it for storytelling. Um, I think for uh, my, my company, Kitchen Bands, is a performance creation company. We work with a lot of different kinds of media in, in different communities. And so this project is really an opportunity for me to learn, I guess, how to use VR as a storytelling tool. And so, um, yeah, we've been really lucky to work with, with Toaster Lab on that as our partners. And we are right in the middle of figuring out how to make this whole project work. <laughs> so um, yes, I can update you later on how everything goes. Uh, let's, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Are you? Uh, that I can you have a few more minutes if you, there's anything else you want to say, Erin, or. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think like one of the challenges of working on this piece is obviously it's in a, a public area. Um, we, the staff, have been really great here, and you know we pitched the project as being we want to film in the library while it's open and while people are using it. So, um, just trying to coordinate you know, how people feel about being on camera and even trying to explain this idea of what virtual reality is to people when you're trying to get them on camera has been uh, has been interesting. And even trying to explain the idea of the project that this isn't, uh, we're not making a movie. I mean, we are, we're making some kind of a movie, but it's really about trying to capture what it's like in this particular place at this particular moment and share a different perspective with people. Um, so we've also made uh, an effort to try and get as many uh, ideas from the community as possible, where we've been um, talking with the staff and they've been super helpful. We've also been talking about the history of this area. And I think um, a library is a space that, that I know I, I love using it. And this particular space is so well used by the community. Um, it, it can sometimes be hard to see a space that you use in a, in a functional way as a, as a place of, of magic or as a place of unexpected, um, that, would, that would show you something unexpected. But I think that's exactly what libraries do. So I'm hoping with this project we'll be able to um, kind of, I mean, what I'm interested in as a storyteller is how, how do you show the layers in the story, right? How do you combine design and music and projections and whatever tools you have um, in order to show something makes you question what you are. So I think um, virtual reality in a, and specifically in creating in a space where we're seeing the unexpected and also the very ordinary in a way that lets people, um, we'll be filming with our cameras this week and next week and hopefully all goes well. <laughs> we will be able to, um, we put a lot of effort into trying to script um, and create uh, with our participants and something that, that they find meaningful. Um, and then we'll put it together for the public uh, later on in December. So if you're around, come and check it out. Thanks. Thank you so much, Erin. And Erin will be available for questions towards the end, too. Um, I think one of the things that I've loved working about with Erin and Ian on this project is coming up with really like a novel curriculum that kind of extends over a reasonable amount of time rather than like a, you know, this is a camera kind of crash course that's really been able to take our time and work with the participants to come up with um, original stories for folks who have not really had a chance to use this material and uh, equipment before. I'm very pleased to introduce to the stage uh, Harrison Forsyth talking about Historic 3D. Uh, hello, thanks a lot for uh, having me here today. Um, 
My name is Harrison Forsyth. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in the history department at York University. And um, today I'm here to discuss how augmented reality is an ideal medium for allowing students and the public to engage with ancient artifacts, in this case, um, Roman funerary inscriptions or tombstones, uh, in new and exciting ways. Uh, I was hoping to have a working prototype of my new, new newest application here today, but um, it requires me to do a 3D scan of a Roman inscription that's um, currently at the Royal Ontario Museum, and I still need to do a whole bunch of paperwork in order to have access to that. Um, so uh, I'm going to have to sort of speak by analogy or through analogy using this um, PowerPoint. Um, but just a little bit about um, my background uh, before we get started. Um, my background's in Roman archaeology, and I work on several ongoing excavations that take place in Spain and Italy. And I specialize in a process called photogrammetry. So that's uh, taking a series of photographs and making 3D scans of the artifacts that we excavate and also the environments that we're excavating. So these are photorealistic um, in ideal terms, usually. Um, and in recent years, because part of my duties as a PhD candidate are teaching, um, I've also taken an interest in using VR and AR as a teaching tool in the classroom. Um, so I've developed several programs that bring the material that I scan in the fields into the classroom uh, for the sake of uh, teaching students about archaeology. So some of the examples of this might include uh, this program uh, that I designed um, uh, in collaboration with University of Victoria for teaching students how to interpret archaeological stratigraphy. Um, so this is in the HTC Vive um, platform. Uh, I also created a mobile app that allows students to explore and learn about the Lucanian tombs at Rocca Gloriosa in southern Italy. Uh, so in this case, uh, students can navigate the site, engage with the environment, and learn information about the contents of the tombs, the process of excavation, etc. Uh, I've also had students construct a Roman city using Unity 3D. Uh, I only gave them a three-hour crash course in how to organize um, uh, game objects. They didn't really get into the coding, but they were able to um, create this Roman city and present their, uh, their creation to each other in virtual reality, discussing the context of all the buildings. Um, so despite all of this um, previous work that I've done in using VR technology, I've now sort of turned my focus to augmented reality and how this can be used um, in order to teach ancient history and archaeology with um, 3D models in AR. So the goal of my current project that's in process is to create an augmented reality application that allows users to visualize, manipulate, and learn about Roman funerary inscriptions in new and exciting ways. So ancient tombstones are quite ar archaeologically unique since they both have um, they have both a visual and a textual component to them. So you don't only have the object, but you have somebody who wrote, this is why I made this object, and this is why it's here, and these are the people who are involved. So there's a lot of information that can be taken from uh, one tombstone. Um, so some of the features that I hope to include on this, um, or that I have to a certain extent in my early iterations, are to allow for a 3D photo scan of a Roman tombstone to be viewed and manipulated using a phone camera, and um, an optical reference so that you can place it on any surface. So that object would be attached to um, like a QR code, for example. They're, they're just really easy to work with. Um, uh, also, I hope to have uh, points of interest on the tombstone, on the actual 3D model, that can be highlighted to provide details via a text overlay. So these would include, most importantly, a translation of the Latin text, uh, information about the people mentioned, and also information about the world in which they lived. So this is taking specifics and then getting general about it so that it's more accessible to an audience of individuals who want to learn about um, this type of archaeological material. So all of this will allow for complex um, linguistic and visual subject matter to be accessible to students in the public. Uh, I have started experimenting with some of my uh, 3D models using augmented reality um, with the Vuforia SDK. Um, and here, this is a very, this is the first 3D model I ever made, so please excuse its crudity. Um, but uh, in any case, so to a certain extent, uh, it too, if you're looking at a photograph, or even if you're viewing something that's in a glass case. Uh, so it really sort of breaks down that. And hopefully in this case, it would encourage people to go to the museum and engage more with this type of material. Um, so the funeral inscription that I plan on uh, uh, 
in any case, as you can see, there's a visual element to it and there's a textual element to it, even though the textual element isn't um, incredibly clear. So um, since I assume that most people are the spirits of the departed, eight years, 10 months, um, and Mark made this tombstone um, for him. This. So some of these, so we know this is from the late first century or second century CE. Um, uh, also, you can learn a lot of, um, we, based on their names, we know that they're actually probably freed slaves. So this, this person is a first generation of, um, uh, the first freeborn generation of a conjugal um, couple. And so that also brings up a lot of issues of the nuances of socio-political status and all of these things. Now, of course, all of these details require context. Uh, but what emerges here is a snapshot of a Roman family. And while many of the specifics of their life are unclear, the little, little minutia, um, much of their experiences are actually rooted in general information that we know about daily life in the Roman world. And so in this respect, augmented reality is an excellent way to supplement this specific information with more of the general information that allows a broader audience of students to engage with funerary inscriptions. So this addresses a serious issue of accessibility um, on several levels. So using this as an analogy, if the app were finished, um, uh, let's just assume that this is the 3D model and it's been a particular part of it's been highlighted. Um, one could view the 3D model uh, in their home or in the classroom using an optical reference like a QR code. Um, and they could highlight parts of the text or the object uh, with a translation of what the text means and supplemental information about that. So in this example, we have the name of the deceased uh, and additional information is given about each of the deceased's names because Roman naming practices are very particular um, and uh, completely different from typical Indo-European naming practices, which again is another lecture. Um, <laughs> so for example, again, uh, Another area that could be highlighted, again, the invocation to the D manes. What does this mean? So this text overlay, um, imagine that this is on the camera of your phone, um, would give all of this sort of supplemental information about the religious significance of that, etc. cetera. Um, again, so those are the textual elements, and then there's also visual elements that could be commented on, right? So um, this could be what types of building materials were used to build the tombstone, artistic motifs, and overall the general um, uh, design of the object itself. So what are the benefits of this? Um, one of the main benefits of um, studying Roman funerary inscriptions in AR is you get a sense of immersion and scale that you wouldn't otherwise get from a photograph or an object that might not be um, that might not be generally accessible. Uh, and again, uh, it makes artifacts more accessible, so they're viewable at home or in the classroom. And in other cases, a lot of museums tend to have a lot of their material tucked away in, in the basement. They can't put everything out. So um, this is even a way for museums to encourage people to engage with material by making uh, the things that aren't available accessible to the public. Um, it's also more engaging from a human perspective. Um, there's something very emotional about reading a tombstone, um, no matter what era it comes from or what context. Um, same thing with viewing ancient materials. Um, so in any case, um, that's sort of my pitch for this, uh, for this application that I'm working on, and I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming here, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. David Hahn talking about after Dan Graham, and David is a PhD student in the Department of Cinema and Media Arts here at York. Hey, um, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to Toaster Lab, Jesse and uh, Ian for inviting me, and thanks to Sensorium and York for hosting this symposium. Um, my name is David Hahn. And uh, I'm a media artist, uh, educator, and PhD student here at York. Uh, my doctoral research creation work explores the poetics of VR using an experimental structuralist approach uh, informed by media arts uh, from the 60s and 70s. It's uh, research that's supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And today I'm gonna to be discussing uh, my latest work after Dan Graham with a focus on how I view the work through the lens of research creation. 
So I'm going to start with a brief description of the work, along with a brief description of the work this work is based on. And I'll touch on how I believe this work of research creation generates knowledge, um, just what kind of knowledge that might be and why that knowledge might be valuable for helping us think through or understand the kinds of challenges posed by the immersive media technology we've been talking about today. <clears throat> so After Dan Graham is a uh, mixed reality art installation, an experimental virtual reality experience. The project was born out of a desire to investigate the poetics of VR and seeks to examine the creative potential inherent in VR's ability to create affective kinesthetic experiences. I'm wondering if we could run that video, the first one. <clears throat> the installation takes place inside a single room, which is empty, save for four uh, monitors, two mounted on one side and the other two mounted on the opposite side. Wow, that is really jittery. Um, Maybe we should just pause that, that's a little nauseating. <laughs> um, the installation takes place inside a single room. Um, the single participant is invited to put on a VR headset, carry two hand controllers, and put on VR trackers on both their uh, waist and their feet. And inside the virtual reality environment, uh, the participant is placed inside the body of a featureless humanoid avatar whose movements correspond directly to the movement of the participant. Looking around, they see a recreation of Dan Graham's video art installation, Time Delay Room 1. And every 16 seconds after the VR experience begins, a new virtual agent spawns in the initial location of the participant. And as shown, uh, what you're looking at here is um, this virtual agent that spawns looks identical to the participant's avatar, and its movements are based on the movement of the participant on a 16 second delay. So over time, the room becomes populated with a crowd of virtual agents, all echoing the past movements of the VR participant. slide. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, those outside of the virtual environment not wearing the headset are free to move around the installation and observe both the VR participant and the four monitors. Um, these monitors display the same images as the four monitors inside the virtual environment. So two of them are showing a live camera feed of the virtual environment and two are showing those same feeds but on an eight second delay. And in this way, these monitors provide our sort of windows into the virtual environment, an environment that sort of exists as a uh, virtual palimpsest of the actual environment in front of them. The installation is, on which this work is based is uh, Time Delay Room 1, a closed circuit video installation created by American artist Dan Graham in 1974. And as seen in this illustration, the installation featured two identical rooms, each surveilled by a closed circuit video camera, cameras A and B. And in each room were two monitors. One monitor displayed the real time video feed of the other room. The other monitor displayed the video feed of the current room on an eight second delay. In time delay room one, Dan Graham explored the unique ability of video to capture, transmit, and display real time moving images. He was interested in the way that the unique temporality of video, as instantiated in this sort of closed circuit video feedback loop, could be employed to alter a person's sense of self-perception. And so he writes, if a perceiver views this behavior on a five to eight second delay vid via videotape, so his responses are part of and influencing his perception, private mental intention and external behavior is fed back on the monitor and immediately influences the observer's future intentions and behavior. By linking perception of exterior behavior and its interior mental perception, an observer's self, like a topological Mobius strip, can be apparently without inside or outside. Video feedback time is the immediate present, without relation to past and hypothetical future states, a continuous topological or feedback loop forward or backward between just past and immediate present. And I think this is um, a familiar feeling for anyone who's ever gone money at the bank machine. You see yourself on the camera and there's this sort of moment where it's you're sort of inside and out of your side yourself at the same time. I think that's sort of what he's describing here. <clears throat> 
So um, Graham argues that the unique ability of a closed circuit television system to externalize a perception of ourselves results in the collapse of interior mental perception and exterior behavior. And this creates a sort of unique form of temporality that he calls video feedback time. In time delay room one, he pushed this unique temporality into the physical space of the gallery. So what we're seeing here is a documentation of um, an installation of this, of Graham's original work uh, at ZKM in, uh, in 2001. <clears throat> in doing so, it only became activated in the presence of a participant. And this created conditions under which the collapse of subject and object, interior and exterior, private and public, could only be understood through the participant's embodied presence. In writing about closed circuit video installation art, media theorist Margaret Morse argues that the extension of the temporality of the video apparatus into physical space is the raison d'etre of this type of art. She says, while an installation can be diagrammed, photographed, videotaped, or described in language, its crucial element is miss ultimately missing from any such two-dimensional construction, that is, the space in between, or the actual construction of a passage for bodies or figures in space and time. Indeed, I argue, the part that collapses whenever the installation isn't installed is the art. <clears throat> And Morse uh, argues that the affective experience of closed circuit video installation art lies not in the content of the medium, but rather in the encounter of medium and body. And she concludes that the underlying premise of the installation appears to be that the audiovisual experience supplemented kinesthetically can be a kind of learning, not with the mind alone, but with the body itself. And that this learning occurs at the level of the body ego and its orientation in space. And it's this kind of learning this kind of embodied knowledge that the research emerging from after Dan Graham produces. In that sense, it's much different than the kind of knowledge that other more traditional research methods might produce. <clears throat> Writing about this difference uh, in the kind of knowledge that research creation produces, media archaeologist Wolfgang Ernst writes, academic media theory brings out the epistemological surplus which is dormant within media technologies. Knowledge needs to become explicit in order to become reflective. And this primarily takes place in the medium of verbal text, the classical cultural technology as practiced in universities. Different from that logocentristic explication of knowledge, there is implicit knowledge, and here he's making a reference to um, Michael Pollyanni's um, idea of tacit knowledge. Um, and this knowledge stays in a kind of latency within, within the media. Artistic practice can evoke this implicit episteme to create affective forms of insight. But both academics and artists must be tuned in the right way to be able to resonate with that knowledge. And I, I really like this quote because I think it speaks to what happens in After Dan Graham. I see this work as creating the conditions for participants to both consider the implicit or tacit knowledge rooted in their very own bodies by confronting them with that data they impart through the use of the VR technology. And so um, this is the third clip, <clears throat> if we can play it. Hopefully it won't be uh, <laughs> great. Well, that's too bad. Um, on this latter point, the pro <laughs> wow. On this latter point, the project's use of the feedback loop to incarnate a participant's corporeal data in the form of a population of virtual agents expands subjectivity beyond the participant's virtual body into a multiplicity of exterior observable bodies, foregrounding the internal operations and unique temporality of the VR apparatus, and making evident the corporeal data that is the very foundation of VR. Indeed, the data collected by the surveillance of the body of the participant is fundamental to the creation of the illusion of immersion within the virtual environment. We simply cannot have VR without this data. <clears throat> this also suggests that the structuralist approaches of the artists of the 60s and 70s, whose work foregrounded the materiality and temporality of the time-based media with which they worked, are important, perhaps even vital, for understanding contemporary emerging media technology. Furthermore, after Dan Graham virtually recreates what Morse called the space in between offered by the original artwork, 
The multiple virtual agents that populate the virtual environment are felt as much as they are seen. And echoing Morse's sentiment regarding the closed circuit installation art of the 60s and 70s, the part that collapses whenever the VR headset is taken off is the art. And this positions closed circuit video installation art as a sort of proto VR and suggests that the affective potential of VR lies not solely in what is represented, but rather in the encounter between body and media content. Thanks. Um, if you'd like to see those video clips <laughs> that are not stuttering, you can go check us out on the, online. Thanks. Uh, awesome, thank you so much. Um, next, I'm happy to introduce uh, Uh, hello again. I'm happy to introduce my friend, Anna Cusarena, who's uh, from the Friends of Parkway Forest Park to come join me to talk about our Parkway Forest Park VR project. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as Justine mentioned, my name is Anna, and I'm part of uh, Friends of Parkway Forest Park. And actually, the image that was on the screen just a few minutes ago, um, that was taken in my backyard. So if you close your eyes, you can really pretend that you're in our community. Um, so today, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the artist, but uh, the colors, there's a lot of these uh, poles around the uh, community, and they represent that. Um, you know, any community, it's, it's composed of uh, all colors of the world, so that was a good uh, sculpture. Um, anyway, today I wanted to talk about um, a project that's called, um, that was part of Arts in the Parks. And if you're not familiar of, um, about what Arts in the Park is, um, it's a um, program that is sponsored by the City of Toronto through uh, taxpayers' money that is a, a produced from construction sites uh, that are all around Toronto. And actually around this area, we've been having construction for the past maybe seven years or so. So all that money that uh, is collected from these construction sites actually gets and put, it's being placed back into the community to animate the community to make people happy and engaged. And uh, so Arts in the Parks um, is sponsored through this funding by uh, the City of Toronto and is managed by the Toronto Arts Foundation and Tor Toronto Arts Council in collaboration with Park People. And uh, Park People is a charity um, that is started in Toronto and now today is actually nationwide. They uh, help groups like ours, so community groups like ours, to animate parks. So uh, they help us uh, uh, put on events like park cleanups, um, um, arts in the parks, um, also um, community consultations. So let's say if there's another construction project going on in the community, they will help us uh, get the community together and talk about how can we revitalize the park, how can we add amenities to the park that would be beneficial to the entire community. So these are uh, very great resources to have for communities because not everyone knows how to reach out to all these resources. So park people, along with Toronto Arts uh, Council and Toronto Arts Foundation, work together to put together these arts in the parks uh, programs. And Justine and uh, Ian, as part of Toaster Lab, uh, they were uh, granted um, a sp to come to our park to put on these events and um, artistic engagement. Um, and I think uh, the program started about four years ago, and every year uh, about uh, 33 artist groups get sponsored. Uh, to put on events in about 23 parks across Toronto. So during the summer period, you can go to any parks, it's all free of charge, so you can go and enjoy amazing artistic pro programs. So a Toaster Lab, um, we, our park was actually selected uh, from the beginning, from the pilot, and uh, when it started four years ago, and every year we had the opportunity to work with artists uh, or different artist groups to put on events in our park. And I can tell you very honestly that working with Toaster Labs was an amazing experience because a lot of the times, and I think even during the session before, um, 
it was brought up the idea of consult, consulting the community or consulting the indigenous groups or consulting the people that actually live in the in the area about what kind of programs you want to us uh, to want to put on and um, toaster labs was amazing to work with because even before they actually applied for the funding they came to us and they were like hey we have this idea what would you like to do? Or do you have any ideas? Um, where should we locate it? What are the best times that you guys can uh, attend our events? Because we realize that you also have other events that you put on during the year. So it was a great collaboration from the sense of being included. So today I wanted to actually touch up on three amazing learnings that I actually got to experience in working with Toaster Lab. And first one I just mentioned is uh, really including the people from the start um, and uh, asking for a people's opinion. For example, um, everyone goes through their community walks from through their community. They understand um, what are some of the groups that are more isolated than others. Um, a lot of the community groups, for example, we have a WhatsApp group where we um, there's about 500 people that are on this WhatsApp group and e everyone helps each other. So if there's a person starting a new business or a person needing some uh, extra cash to rent out a place, everyone posts on this uh, WhatsApp group and you have the whole community coming together to help each other. So um, when you're coming into the community and putting on an event, you may not know that these community uh, virtual communities exist. So uh, being connected to someone in the community from the start is very important because you can get quick access to, the to a, group, a large group of people from the beginning. The second learning is that um, it was really nice how Toaster Lab, for example, they made it about the users. So the, uh, the event was a um, workshop series of four days for kids to learn how to use uh, VR technology and to put on a, um, a theater play and also to um, show community members their theater play. So over these two weeks, uh, two weekends, uh, they learn how to use the technology, uh, shot the movie, then they put it together, and then they taught, they showed it to the entire community. And uh, kids, the kids were doing everything, and they loved it. They came up with the idea what to shoot, they came up with uh, how to work together in, in groups. Um, they were the ones who were trusted with the technology. So I remember you and saying, oh, you guys, you have to be very careful. Don't put it in the sun. And you know, it's sometimes it's very scary to let a, like, an eight-year-old you know, deal with all this high tech. But it was so great to get, to allow them to, um, to, f to fully trust them with the technology and also to fully trust them with explaining what they're doing. Um, and you, if you were there, you, you could see their smiles and how excited they were to show just random people passing by uh, what they did during that two week, um, during uh, that two weekend uh, workshop. Um, and then the third, um, the third uh, learning that uh, I drove from this experience was to really be flexible and uh, manage things as you go along. It, from my experience in uh, participating in community projects, stuff happens all the time. Um, and sometimes, no matter how much planning you do, um, it doesn't go your way. So for example, um, sometimes um, facilities may be closed. Um, sometimes uh, maybe not everyone shows up at the same time. You have to be flexible. The one learning that I really loved was, for example, a majority of the kids were about eight to 13, uh, maybe 12 years old. But there was one, one girl who was about 16 years old. And maybe for us, because we're like, has that age, a 12-year-old with a 16-year-old, they look kind of the same, or they act the same. But actually, for them, it's a huge difference. So the 16-year-old wanted to be part of the group and felt included, but at the same time wanted to feel different. So you saw, when you looked at the whole workshop, you saw like the little kids working together and the 16-year-old uh, hanging in a tree, looking down on them, and then experiencing the event from a different perspective. But what I liked about Toaster Lab was that actually they catered the learning experience to, to both 
to include her as well. So they noticed that, you know what, this kid has, a different, has different needs or likes, enjoys different things. So they were like, okay, what do you want to do? So they, it was never a prescriptive event. Um, so I really enjoy that because um, you can see how uh, they're able to adapt uh, as they went along and actually made the whole experience much more um, enriching for everyone and inclusive. So that's about it. Thank you. I'm just going gonna, gonna to jump in on the presentation and yeah, you can sit down if you want. Oh, I wanted to show a couple more slides from that one if we could go back to it. Um, Oh, okay, no worries. So um, here's the youth <laughs> doing some warm-ups in the community center. And as you can see, like that looks just like a stick, but it is a 360 camera uh, that a child is holding there on a monopod. And we got some really incredible footage that the kids were like creative and really reckless with the cameras at the same time. But it also made for some like stunning uh, footage that we would have never been like bold enough to do, like dragging the camera through the grass, which created an incredible, like very animalistic experience. Um, and as Anna said that at the end of the workshop on the second weekend, we had a pop-up VR cinema here. And this is what she was talking about where the, the kids actually were um, providing the instruction to the adults, to their family members and community members about how to use the Oculus Go headsets that they'd learned how to use, which was really fun. The movies themselves, the videos that the children produced were like a wildly varying quality, but that was completely immaterial. Anytime you watch like a home movie of your family or of your kids, you're gonna love it, no matter what. Um, so the kids had a great time. They learned about the material and the equipment, and they felt confident about sharing it with their family members, too. And then at the end of the summer, um, we were able to create, uh, working with Andrew, a um, using the map tool as a web app, a um, basically like a web app version of uh, the videos that this, the kids had created. So we were able to provide um, headsets to the community. So versions of Google Cardboards um, to everyone for free, and we coincided it with a um, larger cinema event that was already scheduled for the park. So um, it was really exciting. It was a fun way to see the kids again. This was at the end of the summer. We did the workshop in July, and then this was in August that so we were finally able to share it. And here's, a, um, here's our friend Ian looking very pleased. <laughs> VR for the masses. Um, but everyone had a great time because there's a lot of 360 videos that you can watch if you only have this uh, cardboard. So it was really wonderful to get the funding to be able to share this. And this is a quick walkthrough of the web app here. So the videos that the kids created were then geolocated just within the park. And so um, you were able to locate, bloop, adventure story. And they had a lot of fun coming up with the stories for their, uh, for their shows, too. So it was, it was a really fun project, and we had such a great collaboration. And it was really wonderful to be able to be like present and open to what the community wanted. And it was, like at times, extremely challenging, as, as Anna said, because of the facilities and working with folks um, in, in an extremely hot uh, it was like a record-breaking heat wave on the first weekend, and the kids were troopers. They just wanted freezies, and it was fine. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, we have Stratigra Stratigraphic City from faculty and cinema media arts uh, member Tan and Chan. It's a long walk. <laughs> oh, at last, I'm here. All right, so uh, my name is Tayan Ng Chan. I teach in media arts here, uh, cinema in media arts department. And uh, I'm gonna talk about my work, Stratigraphic City, which is a site-specific um, uh, work that has been shown um, in about three different places so far. Uh, so there it is. And so I'm gonna just, let's see. All right, so uh, it was originally presented at the Triennial of Contemporary Art in Windsor, the Art Gallery of Windsor, in 2017-2018. And so because it is site-specific, um, it's basically um, 
a tabletop diorama um, with video projection on it, uh, and then it's interactive using a Kinect uh, depth sensor and um, programming with Max MSP. So here's a little video from the opening. We can play that. Uh, I'll just talk over it as it plays, I guess. Um, if it's going to play. Oh. Yep. So none of the video, <laughs> does, does any of the video play? Yeah, okay, well, I'll just talk while they see if any of the videos play. Um, so I'll just go back here. Um, yeah, let's see if you can see it actually in action. Anyway, so it is interactive, um, and you basically move your hand over the table to reveal the different layers of uh, the, the video map projection. So I'll, sh I'll show you the different um, layers of it. So this is the, the projection that's on the table at the, um, when you first encounter the table. And it's just blank, and it's sort of, um, the idea of a blank city. Like when you first encounter a city and you don't know anything about it, right? It's just a blank map. Um, and what is the first thing that you do when you go to a city and you don't know anything about it? Well, generally you Google it, right? So your, the Google map layer is like your, your first encounter with any place. And so that is the Google map layer there. Um, and so that is like the first layer of the, the, three, the three layers. And then the second layer, and you won't be able to see, so here, if you, if you could see the video, um, it would be the, the, all the information that comes up when you Google a city. And it's usually touristic information, right? It's um, where to eat generally, what things that you do. And so it's all text that would be flying over the, this map. Um, the weather, you know, hotel, tourist information. And then on this layer, if it was working, you would see little images of the city. So the idea of the city image, um, all the things that, you know, generally they are landmarks, um, the, skitty, the city skyline, things like that. So the digital image of that city. And you would see the little images flying around this video that you can't see. And then this, the final layer, and so these, these are um, different layers over the map, right? So depending on where you, you interact with the, the installation, the lowest le level would be the, the Google map layer, the second layer would be like the, the city image layer, and then the very top, and generally I have to go on my tippy toes to get to that layer, um, is the poetic and personal layer. And so on this layer, I would have, um, you know, poems that I've written about the city or little hand-drawn animations um, that would fly in and out of the, the topmost layer. And then you would be able to, you know, over here, you would be able to interact with all three layers. You could actually play the city. That's the idea of swirling all these different layers together. Um, and it's pretty fun. You can see the kids really like it. And so that was um, Windsor, the first iteration. And then I also showed it uh, at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, uh, the Hamilton Now Object Show. And so there's, you can see the, uh, the, ta the table and um, all the different, um, there are little sculptures made out of plaster. And then the very center of the map, which is the where you are now, um, it, it actually, I used 3D printing to create a little uh, model of the actual place. So it's like, you know, the very center of the city is the most detailed, and then as you move out, it gets more and more abstract. And then all the, the little sculptures are made from um, food item packaging, right, that uh, you would find at the grocery store. So it's on a kitchen table. So the idea of the mundane and the everyday in uh, city life. And so when I showed this piece in uh, Hamilton, um, I'm part of this artist collective called the Hamilton Perambulatory Unit, and, or the HPU for short. Um, and we do walks around um, you know, site, specific, spe site specificity, and we have a very, um, 
the strata walk is one of our methodologies that we use, right? So, so for the Hamilton show, um, the, the HPU ha held workshops um, where we had the strata walk, and we had, we would uh, lead these workshops around the art gallery, uh, and people would map this different strata. So the idea of the strata again is the layers of the city that make up a place. And so we have things like the sign strata, right? Identify the text, uh, architectural strata, non-human animal strata, inanimate strata, so plants, rocks, the pre-urban strata. So imagine what was there um, without resorting to, you know, untamed wilderness. Uh, electrical strata, so trace the power lines. Where does the electricity come from? Shiny strata, like look for things that are shiny. And where does the light come from? Maybe you want to draw that. Attraction strata, so it's t kind of taking from the, uh, the situationist derive and, and noticing what repulses you and what is attractive to you. The olfactory strata, audio strata, speculative strata, tactile strata, what, is, what do things feel like? Maybe you want to make rubbings. Storied strata, you know, the strata are really infinite, right? We can like go on forever, cinematic strata, rhythm strata, which kind of takes from uh, Henri Lefebvre's uh, rhythm analysis. Um, and if you're in a group, you want it to be great to, this is how we do it, we designate different strata so that everyone can focus on something different. And so these are some of the maps that we came up with um, for the Hamilton, uh, the, the Hamilton walks. So this, somebody here has um, mapped D birds, right? So we know that there's like peregrine falcons that were close by. They have a nest and they actually have a little camera that you can see them all the time. She's noticed birds chirping, birds flying through the garages. Um, this is a graffiti strata that uh, one of the kids did. So we just noticed all the graffiti as we were walking around the, the art gallery. Um, this one is color strata. So what kind of colors on our walk? Somebody did rubbings with leaves that they found here. Again, uh, drawn um, trees were actually like the most common thing that people wanted to do, tr trees and plants. We had a lot of those kinds of maps. Uh, this one I really love is uh, Wi-Fi networks, right? So as you're walking, you can see what Wi-Fi networks uh, pop up and, you know, on that, that Wi-Fi map, um, which is really lovely and, you know, really funny kind of things. Like, uh, I don't know, one of them I think was like, get your own Wi-Fi. <laughs> Right, and so, um, so all of these, unfortunately, we, you can't see it in action right now, but this video would have shown, you know, it's an inaction of seeing all these different layers integrated together. Um, and so for the Hamilton one, what I did for the third layer, which was the, the, the presentation or the poetic layer, is I integrated all these maps that um, the participants did into that third layer so that they could see it integrated into the, the whole sculpture. And then I did. It, I, I also did it at the Lumen Festival in Waterloo, and which was really interesting because, like you know, in an art gallery, people are kind of conditioned not to touch the art. And in fact, we had to put up a sign saying, "Please wave your hand over the sculpture," so that that's how you interact it, because interact with it, because you know it wasn't obvious to people at first. Um, at, but at the Lumen Festival, um, all the artworks. It's, it's a, a, um, all about projection and light, um, and everything was interactive. And so, so the kids just thought, everybody just thought, oh, you play with the, um, the buildings themselves. So we had a volunteer say, no, no, don't, don't play with the buildings for about an hour. We're like, don't, don't touch the buildings, don't touch the buildings. And finally, we're just like, oh, screw it, touch the buildings, whatever, right? And then it, it changed the, um, how people thought of it, because then they thought that the buildings were what were triggering the light projections and not just the movement in the hands. So I was like, oh, that's interesting how you know, people think of uh, you know, how to interact with, with the work itself. And like if you, I think that the, in, the, um, the, the documentation is on my website, which is soyfishmedia.com, if you actually want to see the videos working. And also we have a Hamilton Perambulatory Unit with, with all those projects on there. And ah, oh, that's it. I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> all right, and uh, I guess I might as well stay up here because I'm going to moderate the discussion. So if I could get all my fellow panelists up here and we can have our question period.
right. Thank you. So does anybody want to start with questions for our panel here? Is anyone, anyone? It's kind of hard to see. <laughs> Uh, anyone out there? Ah, oh, great, in the back. Hello. I'm just curious about the scanning of objects. I think there was, when you scan in objects, can you do that like with an iPad or something in real time, or does it have to be done in advance or something like that? Um, okay, yeah, so there's different ways. Um, there are applications for doing photogrammetry that use cloud computing, such as Trinio, um, things that could, that basically will use uh, phone cameras. I've been doing this for a number of years, so when I started, uh, d the DSLR camera is usually your best bet, uh, one with the largest sensor possible, and um, usually 24 millimeters is like a really good fo focal length. Like the photo, the, the program that I use is Aggie Soft Photo Scan, so it has like certain conditions that are ideal when you're trying to do a photo scan. I would have gone through the process, but I just, it's in 10 minutes, I couldn't really get too much into photogrammetry. But it's really interesting, and so now, um, so I was talking to the excavation director of one of the digs that I, that I do a lot, some photogrammetry work for, and um, when he did the data collection for this season's excavation, um, he had already processed a model, and he said, oh, I, I took these with an iPhone 6S. So you can actually use that, um, those types of cameras that you typically find on a smartphone, uh, even on an iPhone 6S, which is a relatively uh, aged phone by this, by this point, I guess. Um, so yeah, mobile phone technology is definitely usable. I still use a DL D DSLR though, because I don't know, it's more fun. <laughs> no problem. All right, any other questions out there? Well, I have a question to get some uh, stuff going. So, David, I really liked your some of the quotes that you pulled out, right, in relation to your work and with research creation, which um, uh, I really understand as a process of, you know, what kind of knowledge does art produce that that is not produced in any other method, right? And this is a kind of question for everybody as well. But you were saying that. Um, that audience have to know how to resonate with how you approach the work, like the idea of the of resonance, and and so how much do you need to teach audiences how to do this? Because all this is new technology, and sometimes people are like they don't get it or they're scared to maybe put a headset on, or um, and you have to like teach them certain things to get them to understand how to resonate, right? I think that. Um a context matters a lot. Um, so we presented this work at uh, Five Arts, which is a festival specifically for augmented and virtual reality. Uh, so a lot of the people attending that festival, um, if they had never done VR before, they had already done uh, VR experiences prior to entering our experience, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but that, that being said, I do think that um, both AR and VR have the advantage of um, taking advantage of what we already naturally do with our bodies, right? I mean, all, we had to, all I had to do with, with after Dan Graham uh, was just once the headset was on and sort of once you're beyond that sort of onboarding people into the actual technology is just say, feel free to walk around. Um, and people immediately just kind of just kind of get it. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, for me, exploring this technology, um, one of the things that's most exciting about it is that um, it speaks to us in a way that feels very natural. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure how much training needs to be done ahead of time, but I, I, but I do think that um, uh, because it's tapping into that, our natural, um, we have these bodies, we're moving through space, um, and they're designed to, to present us with images that um, at least try not to make us nauseous. Uh, yeah, I um, actually get pretty nauseous <laughs> <laughs> myself, which is funny because I teach it. But <laughs> does, do, do the rest of you find also that it, it 
people find it quite naturally, because some of you teach with it, or you're working with children, or with the general public, right? Um, is in case of the library. Um, I, I can say for my, uh, for my experience, the first time that um, I met Toaster Lab, I was like, wow, I don't think anyone in my community is going to know what VR even stands for. And I was suggesting like, hey, you guys, can you just put virtual reality on the posters instead of putting VR? But to my amazing surprise, almost everyone knew what that was, and it was just me <laughs> who didn't know anything about VR. And actually, I got to talk to a lot of people um, during the event, too, and they, were, they said, you know what, we've been in Canada for a month. Um, this, this, this particular group was from India, and they were like, yeah, we've been working on VR and virtual reality stuff, and even back home. So I think... People are very well versed in how to use technology, and they're very, um, uh, very intrigued by it. Um, especially using it in open spaces, because you technically, you you feel like oh, um, technology is for the indoors, um, but now it's coming outdoors. And um, yeah, I'm, for me, I, I was personally surprised how many people were actually so familiar with it, and they got into it right away. Well, I wanted to compliment David too because um, the, at Fivers you could give like tickets to pick a certain number of experiences, and then you would rate them afterwards. And I went after how there was a kid who like who rate you were supposed to rate it, I think, out of five or something like that, and he was like a million. <laughs> 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 and I missed it, but you were someone else was just well, maybe you or someone else was describing. I was like walking around like Spider Man on the floor, and I think kids are like natural boundary pushers, as I know intimately, and um, they're willing to like take on these risks with their own body and like hurdle themselves with these technological problems in the way that we might be feel a little bit more fragile about. And I think the kids working with our cameras were like willing to be like, absolutely, I will climb to the top of this tree holding a monopod in my hand. We were like, please hold on <laughs> to the tree. But yeah. Um, we've been using some of the Parkway Forest uh, videos as demonstrations for our project, just to kind of explain you know, the kind of project we're looking at. And so if we just say, okay, put this on, and this is a project that some kids did in a park. And the one of the kids where I think they bring the, the, the camera up the tree, that's been uh, really helpful in explaining you know, what you can do with virtual reality. Because I think it, and it also kind of gets people in the framework of, they remember what it's like to be a kid. It's that experience of seeing the world through someone else's eyes. So thank you to Parkway Forest for, for helping us out with that. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been a really helpful demonstration. Great. And yeah, and David, actually, you won an, an award during Fiverr's, right? I just had to mention that. Yeah, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that kid, we won the People's Choice Award for Best Interactive Experience, and um, maybe that kid, kids won million points, uh, <laughs> went a long way to helping that, I don't know, I don't know stuffing the ballot box. Right. So, so children seem like they take naturally to technology, right? But um, have you, any of you encountered any like problems of accessibility and you know because we're not all um, naturally into technology especially o older people or if if you're differently abled in any way right so have you en encountered like any problems with, with that I can just um, speak from the behalf of um accessibility in terms of language. Uh, so in our community, because it's a newcomer community, um, a lot of the events that we have, sometimes we need to employ translate, translators. And when it, when it comes to technology, you can just show what you can do with it without having to explain much. And it feels so inclusive. It's like knitting, you know? Like you don't have to talk about how to technically knit. You can just show someone how to knit and they will feel included. So I think um, in terms of language, it's, very, it's a great resource to use uh, to, feel, to make everyone feel included. Like on, on the other end of that too, like I, Sometimes when we're talking about uh, teaching like 360 filmmaking and um, 
we talk about wanting to like pick up and move the camera quickly. We'll just think about like when you were a kid and someone just like picked you up and like moved you around and how like that creates a kind of a lack of agency sometimes. Like mm. you're in control of like the physicality of someone and that's a lot of responsibility and you can physically make them sick too. And I, you know, I think you really like um, the, having at least a knowledge that you're going to could potentially have that impact on someone is really like important to keep in mind too. And I I find also that like if people are wearing glasses, I mean even really simple stuff like that. Like yeah. if you have a different a visual plane, sometimes that's you can't always ensure that like the device you're using is going to give you the same experience as somebody else. It's true because a lot of the headsets do not fit over my glasses, right? And then I'm just like, oh, I can't. <laughs> but also, how, how, what about if people were, say, blind or, you know, in a wheelchair, you know, is, are there issues around those kinds of things? It's probably not something that people think about in... Yeah. With VR, right? Because it's. I mean, very I think it's a question, like questions of accessibility. I know there's someone here who's an expert in that, um, and thinking about um, those sorts of things, uh, that should be further explored and discussed. Absolutely. Yeah, we're kind of like at the beginning of a lot of, you know, how do we approach these things, right? Yes. Um, let's take a break and see if there's any more questions from the audience. Hi, I've got a question. Hi, Tayan. It's actually Hi. a question for you, Tyann. Oh. Um, um, I was wondering, so I love your work in miniature. I'm sorry we didn't get to see the video here, but I love the idea and I love the interface. But my question, especially having attended a number of, you know, looking at a lot of the projects today, um, I'm just wondering if you could comment on what you think could be either gained or lost if those kinds of worlds and all those palimpsests and the poetic layer were actually brought out instead of being a miniature of the city, but were brought in as kind of a mixed reality going through the city visually. I know you've done a lot of sound walks and stuff, but I'm just wondering if you've thought in your own practice of what would be what could be achieved or what you would lose that you don't want to lose. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question because um, you know we we think oh there's so much. Potential, right? Like with your work on the Roman, you know, the epigraphs and stuff, like it can open up all these different layers. So with my work of actually looking at layers of the city, it could really bring out, you know, oh, like, uh, you know, historical tours would be a great, really great example. Like what was there before, you know, or, you know, when you can go in through Google Maps and you can go back through time, you know, can imagine like being in the city and being able to go back through time in that way. Um, you know, there'd be so many great applications that I could see with that. But the other, I think the drawback, though, would be, of course, that you're walking around the city, like, you know, on your phone, <laughs> like staring at a screen, right? Which makes actually moving through the city a little bit harder. Um, which is why I, I do sound, like sound is such a great medium because then you're not staring at your screen, right? You're, you're actually engaging it through the sound. But, you know, you don't get the you know, the historical photos and stuff like that, which would be the best thing, I think, to layer over. And you know, and other things too, poetry. Um, I think there are actually maps, like interactive maps, um, in London, for instance, of all the different poems that have been written about London, and they're geolocated to where they are. You know, things like that could really be brought out. So yeah, great question. Um, I was wondering if anyone on the panel can speak to the potential of emotional affect with augmented reality versus virtual reality, because I know with virtual reality, the affect is quite high. Uh, I think one of you were talking about how when someone has the goggles on and they're experiencing a piece of theater, sometimes it's inevitable that they might cry. Um, but what, what about augmented reality when you're seeing both the physical and a, a piece of technology that's supposed to convey another message? Test. Anyone? <laughs> I mean, we can t I can talk about uh, our experiences with, um, with, with transmission, not, not necessarily Parkway for Forest Park and doing augmented reality in that way. I think it depends upon um, a lot upon like the viewer's willingness to hone in on whatever it is that's that's happening on the screen. 
um, and maybe tune out or either incorporate whatever is going on in the physical world around them. So it's highly dependent on per someone's willingness to like dive in or the the actual layer that you're giving them to um, engage with. And I think part of what we can do with augmented reality is try to tell compelling stories in any medium that we're working with. And if someone is deeply engaged in a compelling story, uh, then we hope that the affect is inevitable. If I, may. I, I don't know if that I've been successful in doing that yet, but I'm trying really hard. <laughs> if I may add to that too, I think that um, one of the advantages of uh, virtual reality is the form factor and the way that it sort of closes you off to the real world. Um, and, and hence the, that, that heightened sense of affect, I think. Um, and, and the fact that with AR, I mean, particularly on mobile phones, you're always sort of being mediated through this screen, right? Um, so I wonder if, you know, once the form factor for AR becomes something less obviously mediated, what, um, if we also get a, a heightened sense of affect uh, along with that. Um, it's an open question, I think, and, and, and clearly the technology is trending in that direction, so. Like, you mean like, like if we had Google Glass and we were just like immersed in your glasses, it would be there all the time. I think <laughs> augmented reality also, like, just adding on to that, augmented reality gives you the opportunity of, like, surprise, like, finding something, like a scavenger hunt sort of joy feeling, which I think it's, like, uniquely suited to that particular medium. Um, I think also in terms of augmented reality, it would be interesting to see how it can, from a community point perspective, uh, how can... Um, how can the technology connect the people to the places where they live? Um, because, for example, uh, we would have nature walks or just um, neighborhood walks introducing new community members to the history of the, um, of the community. And just probably I'm imagining seeing how the... Uh, how the neighborhood had changed from time to time or learning the name of a tree that's right next to their home. Um, I remember some uh, some of our community members saying, you know, I may not know people, but I know this tree. And it's kind of connecting them to the place. So um, I think it, there's a huge opportunity, the way I see it, to kind of make more connections uh, between people and inanimate objects through this like augment, augmented reality. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question in the front there. First, thank you for all the five hours shout outs. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Steph. Oh, hi, hey, Steph. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> it's hard to um, see. <laughs> I just wanted to ask everyone how much they think about the social aspect of bringing in a group of people into an experience. Um, I've seen so many different projects who have not thought about it or they have tried and failed. Um, I'd be interested to see how, what you think about in that process of creating, whether it's an app or a game or a project and how you kind of go about it and what you see. Well, well I know for, um my work uh, for After Dan Graham specifically, those monitors for me were really important as a way to have the virtual sort of leak out into the real world and have a way for people who aren't in the headset to get a sense of what, what they're looking at. Because you, know, you go and watch someone in VR and you just see a person standing around you know, like waving at things that aren't there. Yeah, it's um, pretty funny, right? To yeah, watch yeah. People like um, <laughs> in VR. Uh, and so I think that beyond just having a monitor that you can see their view, uh, I'm really interested in in um, exploring that idea of of um, finding ways to bring the virtual into the real for people who are watching. Um, 
it's interesting. I was just reading um, uh, Gunning's article on on early cinema, and he's talking about you know uh, the excitement around watching these early films. Um, and I was all I could think about was that's a theater full of people who are all having the same experience, right? Uh, whereas in VR, it's like one person's going, "Wow, this is amazing," and everyone else is going, "Wow, what? look at you!" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important uh, to, to to consider uh, that social aspect to to think about how to bring. Um, whatever that experience is out. And, and particularly to explore the differences there, right? I think mm, that there's a, yeah. a lot of potential to explore the yeah, differences Yeah, it's a different, there. totally different way of, you know, consuming media, right? And that's actually, um, I actually want to get a dome in uh, media arts, right? So that you have like that, be able to have that immersive communal experience together. And that's like a whole other thing, like, you know, going to the planetarium, like, right? But, but like the dome experience would be able to enable multiple people to have the same experience at once, but it wouldn't be as, um, you know, the point of view would definitely be very different, right? Because VR is like, you are, you know, you don't have a body or you do have a body, but it's a different body, but everything is your, um, point of view, but in the dome experience, it would be more like, uh, well, another world, like, but walking through another world together, right? And I'm interested in exploring that. I was on a plane once, and there was a guy with a Oculus Go headset on and noise canceling headphones, like in a plane in the sky, and it was just like the image of like. Bye. Do not talk to me. And I think <laughs> that's like that's how it works for some people. And like that might give them some sort of social relief from like reality that they really need or crave. And I think that's a valid thing too. Um, at the same time, like something that's really important to me is like especially working in augmented reality, it can be a social thing at the same time. Like you can have a shared experience. And, and at the same time, like depends on what you're showing in virtual reality too. Like we've taken 360 videos of our kids' birthdays and it's been incredible to like really, like it almost feels like go back in time and experience those moments again in a way that we wouldn't normally be able to. Yeah, I mean, especially with archeology, span that's one of the reasons why I thought to take the photogrammetric work that I was doing and um, and allow people to actually step into the site because like there's all sorts of accessibility issues with archaeological material yeah. like whether you know the prohibitive cost of travel or um, other reasons that people might not be able to visit a dig site while it's happening mm -hmm. um, and in, in that respect it's also um, it also has like a social aspect to it as well um, in the sense that you have colleagues that might be all over the place, or you know, you have your photogrammetrist is running around, and then your archaeozoologist is in Greece for three weeks or whatnot, and then um, you know you can get together and say, oh, just put the headset on and let's go through the site and talk about the stratigraphy or whatnot. So yeah, yeah but I, I think also to your point, and I actually really loved the idea of exploring archaeological sites, is because um, I've learned a while ago that a lot of these sites are actually extremely uh, fragile. So the more people actually go to these sites, they can get deteriorated depending on how much moisture there is, especially if it's an enclosed space. So I think in terms of social um, component, uh, you can really use these um, videos or a technology for generations to come. Um, so in not only to just protect and inform about this site, but also to help others that may not be able to get there. So I think in a social perspective, it's not just about today, but it could be like many, many years from now on. So, Aaron, did you want to say anything? Yeah, just one idea for our project was that we are creating a, an archive of sorts of the community and the stories that are happening in that community so that it will also be available online for people to access or for new people coming to the community to um, see what their library has to offer them and also a little bit about the people that use it and their stories and history. So I think it's it's definitely thinking about um, who the community is now, but also you know who can learn from that in the future. Great, and you know what? I think we're out of time. So thank you, everyone, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. And um, we have closing remarks from Dean Sarah Bay Chang. If she is.
You're here. She's here. <laughs> Come on down. Yes, it's <laughs> As we're clear, let's. Yeah. Well, it's clear, but yes, you already introduced Sarah. So. Go for it. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Come on up. I'm going to do the dance. <laughs> Exactly. I, uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm not going to take up too much of your time um, because you've been here all day and it sounds like it's been just an absolutely amazing uh, symposium. So I just want to recognize uh, the great folks of Toaster Lab, Ian and Justine Garrett, right? And uh, I believe you heard from Joel Ong of Sensorium earlier. And so my just tremendous kudos to, to these colleagues who've done such a great job putting this together. Um, I am uh, the Dean of the School of Arts, Media, Performance, and Design here at York University, so it's my pleasure to welcome you. If, if I had a real life, um, I would have welcomed you in the morning. Um, and, and in fact, it's, uh, you know, I'm a relatively recent dean, so I don't really think like a dean very, very much. And when people ask me how it's going, I'm generally like, it's great. I'm having a really wonderful time. And I have to say that today was the first day so thanks for this, Ian. It's the first day that I've not been able to say I'm having a wonderful time. Because all day I've been in meetings aware that this is happening right in my backyard, right right in my very own building, and I haven't been here for, for very much of it. So, um, so thank you all for coming. I hope it's been a really illuminating, wonderful, invigorating day to share ideas and, and think about the future. I believe this is the first of six. So, so I, uh, you know, it's as a great kind of kickoff event to a sequence of events. Uh, I hope it was really fruitful that way. Um, it did occur to me though, right, as I was sort of sitting here bemoaning all I had missed um, and listening to, to the extraordinary panel uh, here at the end, um, just about uh, thinking about where VR has gone um, over the last, you know, 25, 30 years um, that I've been aware of it and kind of thinking about it. And I was really struck listening to how much when VR first came on the scene, it was all about the future, right? It was like, you know, William Gibson novels and how we were gonna live, you know, uh, in the future and what our lives were gonna be and the synthetic food we were gonna eat and the, you know, weird bland clothing we were going to wear and all of this, right? It was all these projections about, about the future world we were living. And I was, as I was listening here, it really struck me Right, whether it's like children or archaeology or past performances that we didn't get to experience live, how much now VR is really this kind of interesting uh, nexus that allows us to look at the past and how VR technologies inspire a kind of regression and play that um, allows us to look at, uh, at things from the perspective of the past, like as children, right? To, to go back as kids. Um, or to look at a space, um, you know, as in Tien's work, in which we think we have a certain amount of familiarity, um, and to go back and to go under and to go in. And so I'm just really struck at, at the way that this technology, which at, when it first appeared on the scene, seemed to really hearken and speak to a, a, a future, right? And that it would ever be kind of propelling us into that domain, now becomes this really important way in which we rethink, reflect, and, um, and even regress into different spaces and into, into the past of where we are now. So I, was, I just sort of share that as a, as a, a kind of closing thought. Um, it's important for me because as, as, a, as a new dean and as a new member of this community, not just at, at, in AMPD and at York, but also in, in Toronto and in, in Canada, um, I'm really uh, thinking a lot about kind of the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and, and I'm tremendously fortunate to join a community of thinkers and artists and scholars who draw so much insight uh, and community and connection to the past, who are engaging with technologies of the present and reinvigorating and rethinking and, and in some cases totally innovating and inventing new things, um, and then really thinking about how those insights can shape and, and affect our future. And so I just want to really take my hat off to all of the, the York uh, faculty and students who are here today, um, as well as all of our guests, and, and thank you all for being part of this symposium to take stock of where we are, to share your work with each other, and also to think about how we can go for the future. So 
I'm really bummed that I missed so much of it, but I appreciate that it happened here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to say thank you, and, and now I will sort of send you on your way to, to food, right, or caffeine or whatever comes next, right? Because you're talking about next steps, right? Anyway, thank you very much. It's great to be with you. We're just gonna we're gonna gather around yeah. this lecture in here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we just want to talk a little bit about next steps because we're coming to the end here. Um, thanks everybody who has spent the day with us. Thanks to everybody who has tuned in either through HowlRound or through Facebook or through our website. Uh, and we're gonna make all of that available later. Part of this whole project is not just the projects that we've been able to talk about, but also documentation. And that documentation is both for code and, and what's being made open source, but also for this sort of shared learning that we're doing. So uh, all of this has also uh, been uh, recorded and we'll turn around shortly to, to share out so that we're creating a library of people talking about work. Um, as was mentioned, it is the first of six. Um, we've got the slide up here. You, you may see that there are six there. Uh, World Stage Design is sort of a culminating event outside of the series of symposia to, uh, to present the work. Um, what, what, are we, what are we working on next? What are we working on next? <laughs> We're really looking forward to the launch of the uh, trail off next year with yeah. Adrian and Mackie. We're super in the middle of that right now. And uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you want me to talk about tech stuff? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody. Also, I feel like everyone's saying thank you, but it's been a, an amazing day. Uh, my brain is very full in a good way. Um, so let's see, so we have a lot to, of tech coming up. I mentioned at the top of the, uh, the day that we're working on open sourcing all this technology, which we are. Um, the thing about doing an open source project um, is that there's kind of two aspects to it. One is the really easy part, which is here's the code. Um, that's fine. The part that's actually really hard is to make this something that's a community resource that could be used. And that is, uh, as if anyone has been involved, and I'm sure a lot of you have, it's more than a full-time job to just do that. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of slow rolling this. Um, if anyone is interested in the code, I'm more than happy to give you access to it. Uh, the, s the step where we actually have something that everybody can just download and use is going to be uh, part of this Atelier project. Mm -hmm. So we're just actually, uh, even though we have a lot of projects in the works, that part is just at the very, very beginning. Um, so thank you for your patience. I do hope you're excited, um, but we're not quite ready to kind of uh, throw that hat over the fence yet. Um, but Ian, had you, had you gave me a short list of, of specific tech things that you wanted me to maybe chat about. Yeah. Um, so I will, I will talk about that. Um, so one of the things that uh, we were dealing with early on, okay, so uh, step back a little bit. We're doing a lot of work around these phones. <laughs> Not you, you don't want to step back. <laughs> you can, you get it um, we're do, we've been doing a lot of work around mobile devices. And the really cool thing about mobile devices, right, is that they're these little computers that a lot of people have that are jam-packed full of uh, location sensors and most importantly internet access and there's a push in the industry of course to offload a lot of the computation to the cloud um, the problem with this of course is then okay who owns that but then even beyond the kind of conceptual problem there's a technical problem who owns that who pays for it so who's going to pay for that infrastructure? Um, who is going to pay or pay to keep that around? So we have some, some issues here around artworks, like archival and history, how things get to survive. How do you do something like Remember Me at the Prague Quadrennial when we have a lot of international visitors, a very unpredictable network? How do we distribute the content? And we really can't rely on everybody having 3G, 4G, or even Edge, or even Wi-Fi. Um, so we started to try to unpack some of these uh, heavy-duty infrastructure issues. Um, so the map tool that I mentioned has a mode that we can actually turn it completely uh, self-contained so that it just runs on the phone and all of the content is there. Um, we're working on some of those problems with uh, the Swim Pony project as well to package uh, the media and have it downloadable so that when you go on the trail you don't have to try to stream the media. Um, and then there's another push that we're going to start looking at, which is to distribute the content either, um, I mean, I'm using Bluetooth as the shorthand, I'm not sure that Bluetooth yeah. is going to be the technology, but we're trying to come up with some mechanism by which we can do multimedia projects that are distributed and don't rely on the network, or rely on some kind of peer-to-peer -peer networking, um, so we don't need internet access. So that's uh, exciting and interesting, yes. and kind of down the pipe. Um, there's another part of the Bluetooth part, which is using Bluetooth beacons for location work inside. If you've ever worked with location data from the GPS, it's really terrible inside of a building. Um, so there's a lot of indoor projects. <laughs> yes. Um, like Albion is one, there's yes. a few others. 
uh, that we're trying to see what we can do around that. Um, okay, visual anchors, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you said, oh, QR or stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure, so that, I mean, that just might be another way to do it, right? Like trying to come up with some sort of a mechanism that is uh, not too invasive, that would still allow someone to say, come into a space and, um, and get some content. Uh, motion data, we mentioned that, but I think just basically uh, generally aggregating the data. So we have a lot of data that is available on the phones, as I mentioned, and some really neat stuff. Like uh, I just noticed that the HTML5 specification for geolocation actually will give you bearing, which is pretty neat. So we don't actually have to do that work, which is cool. Um, and uh, binocular vision. So some of these projects, so a lot of this, like a lot of the feature set that we're building in comes from the projects themselves. Um, so we're working on integrating some of the 360 video stuff that we can do. And that's an interesting challenge because as you saw uh, briefly, no reason if you didn't notice this, but on the Parkway demo, um, you can access the 360 videos directly on the web version on the desktop. But if you're on mobile, you have to actually tab out to a YouTube uh, player. Yeah. Um, and that's simply because there is no native 360 player at the moment for the uh, web browser on most mobile yeah. devices. So we're trying to see how we might solve that problem um, so that we can integrate 360 video there. It might be a native solution. Um, yeah, this isn't so much a talk, it's just sort of a grab bag. Yeah. But yeah. there's a, a lot of really cool stuff coming. Yeah, and, there's. And, and, so, and I'll, I mean, this is this is a very dangerous thing, but this is a room of very smart know. people plus the we'll entire internet. <laughs> no. yeah, we'll uh, but if you have some idea where you're like, yeah, I wish someone was working on that, I'm not saying that we'll do it. Um, but if you think that it might be interesting for us to consider, then by all means, let somebody know. Somehow. For sure. Yeah. Because we want to make some. We want to make tools uh, that are usable. So you are the community. We are the community. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to add on to that, is that as we're working through what we estimate to be 18 projects, um, <laughs> we, haven't, uh, we haven't identified all of them. There are lots of things that are in the works that don't have specific timelines, that don't have specific production timelines on it, so fitting them within it, they're, they're just sort of, uh, some of that sort of comes about organically. Um, another part that, uh, that we're working on quite a bit that we've run into, a, and I wanted to ask a question about, but we ran out of time in the second panel, was around, actually around IP. So there's a lot of agreements that we've been having to rewrite both between how you work with open source and uh, between these sort of collaborations, especially in artistic collaborations, and who out of that owns what. It's actually really well, as we've been working with our, our, our lawyer, it's actually really easy to make it hard for other people to use your stuff. It's very hard, because it's not particularly profitable uh, to do all the frameworking around that. And we've also done that around like just our agreements around uh, IP uh, of who, when we're collaborating with somebody, such as in Swim Pony, or when we're working within specific, especially indigenous communities where um, we're oftentimes having to write agreements where we're reassigning intellectual property back to the collaborators and maintaining a limited license because it works outside of the assumed ways of working. And so though it's perhaps not as uh, tech sexy a component to it, it's a really exciting part for the way that that uh, this project's been coming together is to be really specific and intentional about the way that we set up our collaborations so they're less of an ad hoc sort of we're gonna assume everybody's gonna be uh, collaborate on this together in the best possible way. No, no, I just wanted to say thanks so much for coming. We, we had a wide range of topics today and I know that as Andrew said, brains are full in a good way. So we just wanna say one final thank you and send you on your way. Thank you.